Hi everyone, I'm Viral Shah. I'm uh, one of the creators of the Julia programming language. And uh, I'm not sure, uh, you know, if I've spoken to an audience uh, that's typically not a data science audience, uh, but uh, this is, I'm, I'm in a DevOps uh, track. So I'm going to try hard to see uh, how I can tailor a talk, uh, you know, for you guys. But uh, maybe just a quick raise of hands of, uh, you know, has, has anyone heard of Julia before you saw the talk? Okay, uh, have you, how many of you have done one plus one in Julia? Okay, <laughs> all right. Uh, I'm assuming uh, everyone's kind of used a little bit of Python, some shell scripting, uh, stuff like that. Is that a fair uh, statement? Yeah, any users of things like uh, R or uh, NumPy? Yeah, okay, a few users, okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a, a, a talk that's uh, like more of an introductory uh, uh, talk for Julia and typically I jump into the presentation, uh, sorry, into, the, into a demo right away, um, but I might just uh, use a little bit of a presentation to motivate uh, why, why Julia and you guys can just tell me if you need, you need me to go fast or if you need me to go slower. Um, all right. So here goes. This should go full screen or no? All right, this is kind of like the boring part of the talk, like it's a presentation, so I'm just going to go through it really fast. It's mainly sort of to have some of you folks who may have not heard of Julia before or maybe Q have heard about it. How many of you saw it on Hacker News? Like nobody, nobody here watches uh, Hacker News? Okay, a couple of people. Yeah, I, th I thought like you just can't miss that stuff. Uh, all right. So Julia is actually a language for technical computing, which means if you are working with a lot of data, or if you're working with scientific computing, if you're working with uh, you know a lot of uh, real-time data from sensors, uh, you know, big data, whatever you have, if you're working on scientific computing applications or numerical applications, uh, Julia is uh, is is the latest uh, programming language in that space. This is actually the last 25 years of technical computing, and you know you might have heard of some of the large fonted uh, languages here, but there's actually about 40 of them out there over the last 25 years, and there is no mention of C or Fortran on these slides, which are the most dominant languages in in this field, and that's because this is a list of dynamic languages for technical computing. So people who do technical computing love dynamic languages, just like. Everyone loves to use Python or Perl or, or a scripting language, right? You don't want to be necessarily always in a strongly typed language for, uh, you know, when, when you want to write uh, productive code. Um, but essentially the reason why we started Julia about, so we started working on Julia in 2009 and uh, it's been about six years now. It was four of us originally, uh, Professor Alan Edelman at uh, the MIT department, uh, at the MIT mathematics department. Jeff Bezanson, and Stefan Karpinski and my, myself. And the four of us started this mainly because we were, uh, you know, we were using uh, various versions of many of these things before. And back then, it was believed uh, that you could either have a programming language that was easy to use and fast, sorry, easy to use and productive, or it was fast. So you could be, a, you could use Python and do your numerical computing, and it was okay, or it was, you know. Uh, but if you had to write for loops, if you had to write worry about memory utilization, if you wanted to put it into production, if you wanted to scale it up, then you rewrite it in you rewrite your Python programs in Fortran or C. Um, uh, similarly, in the similarly in the in in businesses, you would often you will often see that uh, people write codes in. So you'd often see people write, people write exploratory code in languages like R and then translate it to Java for production in, in many uh, deployment scenarios. And so you were always told it was almost believed to be like a, like a law of, you know, like, like a law of nature, like that you could not have something that is at the same time fast as well as uh, highly productive. And that's kind of where we started Julia from. And uh, the, so now, why, the, why is Julius at the same time easy to use? Why is it a dynamic language that's easy to use at the same time? Why is it also also high performance and uh, and achieves uh, you know uh, has, has sort of achieved this uh, larger community over this uh, short time frame? So Julia is 
the, the community, the Julia community is estimated at around 150,000 users right now. And uh, the, if, if you go to our GitHub page, uh, you'll see Let's just give up on this thing here. So if you go to GitHub and Julia, you will see it's a pretty large project. So about, um, it's closing in on 500 contributors now. And uh, while there's a long tail of people who've made a single commit, uh, there are about 30 or 40 contributors who have really contributed uh, to Julia in a big way. Um, you also have, uh, you know, it's just been going on 30,000 commits, uh, you know, lots of stars. So it's, it's, it's kind of becoming increasingly popular. It's taught by, uh, it started about dozens of university, uh, universities today, uh, where uh, largely taught in engineering classes or in the sciences, and not so much in the computer science uh, parts of the university. So you're beginning to see lots of people graduating with Julia skills. And, you know, you know, it was essentially because people thought that there was this law of nature that you can't be fast as well as productive at the same time. When in 2012, we uh, published our Why Julia blog post. And if you just type Why Julia, well, that no longer is the right one. Well, how about Why Julia blog? Okay. Uh, Google has, uh, has down, down, uh, the localization into context. Yes, that might be it. So if you, if you Google why we created Julia, so this was a blog post we published in 2012. And uh, it was kind of a bit of a teaser because it, it talked about, you know, essentially that, you know, uh, you know this, this conundrum of being fast and productive. So people were like, this is absolutely not possible. Like this is, this is a law of nature, you cannot violate it. So, you know, we don't believe it. And then they all clicked and downloaded Julia and compiled it. Back then you, there were no binaries. And then they were like, wow, this really is fast. And it is fun to use. OK, let me start contributing. Um, and what made, very, what made it easy to contribute to Julia is, uh, and which is still the case, is that Julia is what we like to call Julia all the way down. So most of Julia is actually written in Julia itself. That makes it very easy to write high performance code without actually having to switch to C or you know, lower levels. You don't have to be a compiler genius to write, uh, you know, to extend the language or to write a couple of, uh, you know, to contribute a couple of functions. And so everyone who started using Julia kind of was, uh, you know, they started, they're like, yeah, the, the core is great. I mean, this is really fast. And, but I, you know, these five functions seem to be missing. And then they would find themselves writing it and you know, submitting a pull request. Um, let me give a demonstration of why, why that is the, the case. So before we go there, I'm just going to point out, so this is the Julia website, julialang.org. And you know, if you want to try out Julia right away, I don't know if there's a good internet connection here, but you just go there and pick the version uh, operating system and whichever one you want. It's only a 50 megabyte download. You'll get a working Julia, I promise. Um, and then once you get it, you just double click it and you get uh, a REPL. So you can now you know type stuff into it and you know, you, you start with one plus one and that's great. Um, and now, now we sort of, you know, you start seeing why, you know, what's sort of interesting and different about Julia is, you know, one, because it's scientifically oriented, one of the uh, first things I like to type when I start up Julia is, is this function called peak flops. Um, and you notice there was like a little tiny delay after I hit peak flops uh, and then it kind of came through. And, and the second time it's faster, right? And the third time it's also fast. And this is because it's a JIT compiler under the hood. So every time I try something new, it's going to compile it and cache the compiled code. Um, once I have Julia running, I do peak flops. Okay, so this says that, you know, my laptop at its peak is capable of processing 64 gigaflops. So 64, uh, you know, billion floating point operations per second. Of course, uh, no program ever runs at that speed uh, except for peak flops. So. So that's how, uh, that's how scientific, com the whole goal of high performance computing is to have your program run as close to that <coughs> speed as possible. Is this visible from the back? Should I, should I blow it up a little bit? It's okay. Maybe one more. Let's just do one, a couple more. All right. 
Okay, so that's uh, that's Julia. Uh, you know, once you start out now, you know, like I was saying, so everything is Julia all the way down. So, for example, you know, let me just. Uh, you can actually ask Julia what gets run when you do one plus one, and in most in most programming languages, you would not expect to be able to sort of drill down all the way. And but instead, in Julia, we actually. You know, this is one of the first things I would show an audience, right? I'm not showing you how to use Julia. I'm actually beginning to show you how to look inside of Julia first before you actually start using Julia. So I did at which of one plus one, and it says, you know, it's in that file called int.jl. So if I if I have, you know, if I go to my Julia source tree, and uh, I'm on master, so let me just check out and get to uh, release 0 0.4, which is what this is. Okay. So then if I go to base, base is where all the Julia base libraries, so, so the Julia standard library is, and if I do, you know, plus eight int dot JL, it should have that definition right there. So this is uh, the Julia definition for one plus one. And what's happening here is that it's saying, if I add an X and a Y, both of which are integers, you know, add int is an LLVM intrinsic, which will actually generate the code. Uh, the exact assembly instruction that's gonna add the two numbers, and then you're gonna unbox, you're gonna um, unbox the two integers, generate the code, and then box the result. And then the compiler, if it's able to do all its type inference and all its magic, it's gonna get rid of all this boxing, right? So just like any other dynamic language, um, and so you say, okay, that's fine, but let's, oops, let's look at, you know, what actually happens. So you can actually you can actually look at the assembly completely interactively by saying add code native of one plus one and it's kind of doing what you'd expect. There's a bunch of pushing and popping of the stack and then there's the one add instruction. And, uh, and you, can, uh, you can do this for you know, more complex functions as well. So let's say I have a function. So this is a simple syntax for writing functions in Julia, f of x, f of x comma y comma whatever equals something. And, uh, I just wrote this function, which is x cubed plus x squared plus 2. And now, notice I haven't mentioned the type of x anywhere, right? So it's, it's dynamic now. It's, it's depending on what I give it as an input, it's going to do something. So if I give it a floating point value, I get a floating point result back. If I give it an integer value, I get an integer result back. And just to make sure, we can check. So there you go. And let's just make this 2.1. All right, so you've got a floor 64. And then you can kind of look at the code that it generates just, just to get a good sense of what's going on under the hood. Right, so you can see that the actual assembly code it generates for the version that takes an integer versus the version that, that takes a floating point value is qualitatively different. And, you know, this is, I mean, after all, when you talk of why is Julia fast, I mean, or why is something fast, it's always fast because it generates a tight assembly code that can run, run really well. Um, and that's what happens uh, in Julia under the hood as well. It's, it's, uh, but the beauty is that it takes code written in Julia like this. So you could have gone ahead, created a new integer type, and defined it to do completely something different, right? Um, and you will get benefit of the same, all the, all the benefits of the Julia compiler and get, get this tight assembly out of, out, out of your own code. And Julia has many other um, tools that will allow you to look at your code and, and figure out where, where issues occur, um, where, where type issues occur and so on and so forth as you write more and more complex codes. So I, I don't want to go a lot more into the compiler of Julia or why it's fast, but this is just to give you an idea of what it feels like to start being a Julia programmer. Um, so, you know, for like, uh, if you, you know, what, what, what do you like? I mean, for example, if you're a scientific programmer, you, have, you know, you want random numbers and you want random matrices and you want to have large random normally distributed okay. something, you know, vectors, right? And this was 10 to the power 6. Um, how about writing a simple function which just does you know, for i equals one colon n. Okay, let's just. You like the 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 REPL editing uh, on the you know live editing on the REPL itself? That's kind of fun. You can just write whole functions here. Five moments. Okay, 
So I'm going to uh, write uh, a very quick function here where I'm going to take an array A and uh, I'm going to calculate the sum. So let's just say S equals zero and then S plus equals AI N N. And so if I give this function an input like X equals rand of 10 to the power six, and then two of A, I'm gonna time it. Oops, it's, it's X, sorry. And this has to be the length of, sorry, this is what happens when you try to, you always mess, mess up a few things. So there we go. So I, I actually was able to write a loop on an array of a million elements. So this is not some. This is something you can absolutely not do in R or Python or any interpreted language, right? Because you would never loop over something in a for loop going from one to ten to the power six. But in Julia, you just do that. You don't think about it. You just you just write your code. You know it's going to generate that nice assembly. You run it the first time. You see that all this garbage collection happens because the compiler is generating a bunch of garbage as it generates your code. But then the second time, it's the minimal allocation. Uh, it just allocated 160 bytes to do this work. And it ran in you know, almost 100 times faster once it was compiled. And this is about the kind of timing you would expect if you wrote a C function doing exactly the same thing. Um, in fact, Julia will auto-vectorize and generate SIMD instructions and all that good stuff if you do it. Uh, if you, so this is, this is the core of the language. And what people be, uh, begin to use this kind of stuff for is you know, and what I'm not showing you at the moment is uh, stuff like, uh, actually, maybe I'm just going to show you for the last minute before I. So if you go to juliabox.org, you can run Julia on the cloud completely from the browser. Um, you just log in with any Google account. And there we go. So starting from a language that is simple and very basic, People have built, uh, we have about a thousand open source contributed packages at the moment, and you can load gigabytes of data into Julia. You can analyze it on your laptop out of core, or you can load it on a distributed cluster. You can load up, you know, gigabytes or hundreds of gigabytes of log files, you know, uh, run, I, you know, run whatever it is that you want to look for in log files. Often I hear that people are, you know, uh, aggregating, right? You're just counting events, but you know, how to go from counting to prediction, for example, right? I have a large data center, I have all these log files, I'm monitoring these events, I'm collecting all this stuff, but now I want to write a little machine learning, uh, you know, I want to write a little regression, I want to fit some data, I want to see, you know, this is my hard drive failure time, you know, when do I think the next one's gonna go, or which one's gonna be. So it's, it's very easy to sort of start crunching data, building a model, and, and fitting data, running it in production, and having it all be live in real time. Um, and it's, it's not that Julia is great for processing log files, it's just that Julia happens to be a, a great language which has a lot of uh, fantastic mathematical tools, machine learning tools, um, and is incredibly fast. So you combine all this and you can imagine applications that are otherwise pretty hard to do. Um, and uh, let me just uh, show the kind of rich uh, graphics, for example, that you can pull off in Julia. Um, if this, as this page loads up, what I'm gonna show is Julia using Python's plotting capability. So Python has beautiful plotting capabilities. It's in a library called matplotlib. We didn't reinvent the wheel, we just reuse it. And so this is, uh, you know, you can, you can generate all, this, uh, all these kinds of fancy graphs and, and plots in Julia um, by interoperating with Python. It's pretty trivial to call Python from Julia, Julia from Python, in fact, a common party trick is Julia calling Python, calling Julia calling Python, and you can kind of go as, as deep as you'd like. Um, so, and the kernel died, so that's a good sign. <laughs> All right, so, you know, try it out, download it, and let me know, uh, you know, you know uh, throw us a line uh, on Julia users uh, uh, about your experience, and, uh, you know, hopefully you guys will, uh, you know, become Julia users. Thank you.